Hi everybody, um, it's Terry Ryder, founder of hotspotting.com.au and welcome to today's special webinar event. Um, you can be forgiven for thinking that uh, finding capital growth in Australian real estate next year is going to be a frustrating and fruitless exercise because that's what media keeps telling us. But I don't agree with that assessment and neither does my special guest today, Kate Hill of Advisable, who is one of the nation's best and most knowledgeable buyers agents. I think Kate and I agree on this, that we see 2023 as a time that will present good prospects for investors and indeed that next year represents a window of opportunity. Unfortunately, many investors will miss the opportunities the markets will present because they will be swayed by media white noise. They'll hold off waiting for values to fall, but be reassured there will be plenty of growth on offer in 2023. So to find out more about this, let me introduce you to Kate Hill of Advisable. Kate, welcome. Well, hello to you, Terry, and to everybody out there. It's fabulous to be with you in what is nearly December, um, which is slightly scary. And you forgot loved, best loved by his agent in Australia. Okay, but there's, there's something else that's very special <laughs> about you, and, and I'm, yes. I'm going to give you a plug because Kate <laughs> is the co-author of this very good book. I've read it. It's one of the best books I've read on um, property investment. Uh, she co-authored it with... Nicola McDougall. And um, today I received a press release just in fact five minutes ago, which said that um, this book has been given the award for the best personal finance and investor book, 2022 Australian Business Book Awards. Woo! Congratulations, Kate. That's Thank a so much. tremendous <laughs> feather in your particular cap. Um, I, it is a great book. As I said, I read it and found Thank it um, one of the best, most easy to read straightforward, um, well-explained um, tomes on wow. and how to be successful with property coming. investment. Thank you so much, Terry. I mean, I know you have to say that, right, because I'm sitting right here. But um, I, I do really appreciate that. It is a topic, um, just really quickly before we get into our main topic, it is a subject that's very close to my heart. Um, so to have that recognised for me, Nicola, is awesome. So everyone go out there and buy it for your sisters, mothers, friends, Whoever, the woman in your life who you love. There we go. End of plug. <laughs> okay, so Kate, um, you've got a presentation for us today. We're, I we're do. Gonna, we're going to try and get through the slides and the, and the discussion um, in enough time to allow maybe 15 minutes at the end for people to ask their questions, yes. which um, we invite yes. people to do um, by typing into the chat box or the Q&A. And already we have people... Um, typing in what was the name of that book again and, <laughs> oh, and Harry says, hold it up Terry hold it I can't up see, I can't see the name <laughs> of the book look here it is the female <laughs> investor and, and if you happen to be something other than female do not be put off because uh, <laughs> it, it, it's um and while it's um has a particular tailoring towards uh, female investors as the name suggests it actually is a great book for anyone to read absolutely. who's interested in property investment yes absolutely yes um some really good tips for all um it's just it's just the, the motivation was just that it was a bit of a rallying cry for ladies to kind of get on their investing bandwagon sooner than they do but yes the content's absolutely relevant to absolutely everyone however they identify there we go all right so how to find growth in yes. 2023 um and yes I, we will have time to answer your questions uh before the end of the hour as well and there's also a special <laughs> offer i think at the end of the, the presentation indeed yes um so just getting straight into it um very quickly i have to do the disclaimer guys um all the information shared is very general in nature does not constitute personal financial advice always talk to your professionals your preferred finance professionals um a little bit about who we are who i am independent qualified property investment advisors that is really important guys i do put that always first we are all qpias not everyone out there who's buying property for other people is qualified like that um, we're obviously licensed buyers agents we've been working in the industry for many many years we're licensed in multiple states so we don't just focus on the area you know the square kilometer of where we where we all live we're members of pippa reba the real estate institute of new south wales and as i say all our advisors are qpa qualified and fully licensed obviously 
So really, that is us. Getting into our topic of where to find growth in 23, like as Terry suggested earlier on, there is a lot of white noise out there. I'm going to, we, Terry and I, will do a bit of a double act with this, but we will unpack some of that. But first, I suppose I really just wanted to acknowledge that it is really hard to, like I've said here, following the herd. It's, it's a lot easier to be put off by what you might be reading. It's more reassuring to have that social validation, if you like, um, and forging your own path with confidence in times of what I'm calling a perceived uncertainty is not easy. But buying when others are not, um, as long as you are strategic with your asset um, and location selection, it's always been a really sound strategy, regardless of the lending environment at the time. So demand in these quality locations will always be there long term. Um, you have to recognize these short term trends as exactly that temporary short term, even though it can be unsettling at that time. Um, and I, I, like I say, I do acknowledge that that is the hardest thing to do to sort of forge your own path and be the trailblazer when when you, all your reading um, tells you to do the opposite. Um, but it is also it's what sets the successful investor apart from the crowd. You have to look past all of that white noise out there, all of that temporariness and buy in these strategically awesome locations, a couple of which we'll go through. Um, you will always get growth, cap good capital growth in the long term. Just as a, a bit of an intro. So. I thought it might be interesting maybe for five or 10 minutes just to go through this white noise out there. Terry and I will talk through some of this. Terry, if I can bring you in on this. He, Terry has been kind enough to share um, some information with me that he recently presented so that we can talk about this, Terry, about the different sources of information that some of these um, media outlets um, where they get their information from and how it differs yeah. and how it can skew people's opinions and things that they present as fact that aren't necessarily. Yeah. Well, in terms of reporting what's happening with prices in Australia, um, core logic kind of dominates. Um, yeah. There are reasons for that and I won't go into it in great detail, but media tends to present their figures as fact as perhaps the, um, mm. the official source, they're not, they're just one commercial organisation that publishes price data. Um, they put so many resources into publicity, they tend to get more publicity than others. But what's, what's significant to me is that other credible reputable sources disagree with their figures very often, and yeah. including mm. the latest figures. Um, CoreLogic published on the 1st of November, uh, their figures, which showed that um, every capital city and regional area in Australia had price decline in October. But PropTrack, which is the research arm of the organisation that, that owns realestate.com.au, their figures were different. They actually had several of the, um, I think four or five of the eight capital cities actually rose in October according mm. to PropTrack. And SQM Research, another reputable source of great information on real estate, their figures um, are even more positive. Um, I've just looked at their latest figures out. <laughs> excuse me, yesterday, and it shows that in the latest month, um, seven of the eight capital cities actually showed growth in their median house prices. But this comparison on the screen shows the last 12 months, dwelling yeah. prices, that includes houses and apartments all lumped in the big, one big melting pot. And you can look at the figures and see how different they are. CoreLogic says Sydney is down almost 9%. PropTrack says they're down 5.8%. SQM Research says it's almost no change in 12 months. Mm. So you can look across the figures there and see these vast differences. And you might think as consumers that um, how much prices have, have risen or fallen is a matter of fact. Well, actually, it isn't. Um, it's um, a matter of methodology um, and the parameters that you use. Um, they all have different methodologies and they come up with different answers. Um, mm. If you look at the figures there for Hobart, CoreLogic says Hobart in annual terms is down 1%. PropTrack says Hobart is up 3%. And Eskimo Research says it's up 13%. And then look at Canberra. Yeah. It's either up 1% or it's up 20%, but depending on whose figures you believe. Mm. So I think it's very important for 
um, real estate consumers to understand that um, the figures that you're seeing published in media today aren't necessarily fact. They are an opinion expressed by one data source and other yes. data sources quite often disagree. Fabulous. Um, could not have put that better myself. Um, and then also what I think is interesting here, Terry, is your, um, your slide here on how Melbourne and Sydney impact uh, average um, annual dwelling median prices, right? That's right. If, if you look down mm. the bottom of that um, table, you'll see the, the average, the national average from those three different sources. Um, Core Logic has a, a negative figure, PropTrack and SQM are both positive figures, but very small figures in terms of annual mm. growth. But if you look up the, the 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 ones highlighted in yellow, most most of the capital cities of Australia have actually shown much better growth than that. Mm. And yet the the average figure for the country is is quite um, quite negative. And that's because of the weight of Sydney and Melbourne, because mm. those two cities are the cities where prices have fallen according to most sources. Whereas Brisbane, Adelaide, Perth, etc., prices have been a lot more resilient and yes. uh, their annual growth figures are very positive. Yes. But the weight of Sydney and Melbourne drags down the national average and makes the overall situation look quite negative. And that's what media reports. It says Australian property prices have fallen <laughs> 5%. Um, and I think, what the hell do they mean by Australian property prices? We mm. don't have one market in this country. We have thousands <laughs> no. of different markets. And they're, you know, real estate is local. Mm. Understand Ex that. Real estate markets are rising. Yeah, up yeah. Local fields. Absolutely. And you know what? I nearly put in a slide saying exactly that, but I thought, oh my gosh, you know, my Terry Ryder fans have heard me say this so many times. But um, uh, this, to me, this slide epitomizes exactly, exactly that, you know, because as you know, we are, like I said, you know, we're, we're buying for clients all over the country. And, you know, there can be the perception out there that it's kind of easy buying out there everywhere because the media focuses on Sydney and Melbourne because that's where all their readers are. And they forget Adelaide and Brisbane and things that are happening yeah. there. And this chart shows why when we are one of 11, 15 offers in Adelaide, it is not easy buying. It is still a very, very active market. And, uh, it's, and, you know, and yeah. the other factor there, Kate, is not, not only um, <laughs> what you just said, but also the fact that most of our media is written in Sydney and Melbourne. Yes. You know, it's, it's all syndicated <laughs> yes. these days. So journalists mm. sitting in Sydney mm. tend to think that what they're seeing around them is Australia, and they tend to extrapolate their local situation to the whole mm. country. So if Sydney's down, they write it as, as yeah, a national that's, downturn. That's right. What I've noticed in the last 10 or 15 years of analysing these markets is that Sydney and Melbourne are usually the exception to the rest mm. of the country. Yes. More yes. often than not. Yeah. Yes. Agreed. Yes, absolutely, guys. So, um, and and just again, just to put into context some of the things that you're that everyone out there is reading at the moment or listening to, and these things like Terry says, these things that are presented as fact. Um, again, these are shamelessly uh, stolen and shared by the lovely Terry. Um, so you put together Terry some forecasts that were made by all these various people. You know, um, the AMP Capital, SQM Research, some of the banks, Bill Evans, Westpac, he gets a lot of press, um, that were made back at the very start of the pandemic when they were all telling us that our property worlds were about to collapse. Hmm. And how long did they get it? But yes, um, at yes. March, March, April 2020, these sorts of forecasts were coming from all the um, yeah. senior economists of hmm. Australia, people who... Um, supposedly are credible, um, and they were all forecasting significant mm. drop in property prices. Yes. Worst, worst case scenario for Commonwealth Bank was 32% drop. Yeah. And right. one source says prices are going to fall between 30 and 45%. And then what actually happened is this. Um, this so this was by January 2021, where we're looking at our median house prices in all our various, in some of our, well, most of our locations there, um, that they were in fact, and as we all know by now, of course, hindsight is fabulous, um, that all those areas were, had an increase in median values and nationally it was up 6%, but nationally, what does that mean? Um, and then we had exactly the same again. Um, so the forecasts early 2021 for that year, last year were, uh, I think most of them had, perhaps learnt the error of their ways or they all there was a consensus that things would rise 
a little bit. It's all the same people that you see. Um, Shane Oliver, AMP Capital, all the banks, Bill Evans there again, um, that there would be a modest increase in prices. And this is what actually happened. As we all know, 2021, uh, the country's property markets went bonkers. Yeah. Yes, I mean, how could they have got it more wrong? Um, <laughs> In 2020, yeah. they were forecasting a collapse in our markets mm. and prices rose. 2021, they forecast 4 or 5% growth and we got 25%. Yeah. Um, but yes. the point is that right now, these same people, the usual suspects, as I'm calling, are now forecasting again. Yes. Prices are going to drop Yes. 20%. And um, I'm suggesting mm. that people treat it with a grain of salt. They've been wrong constantly in the past and they'll be proven <sighs> wrong again. Absolutely. And I think... Really, the key is that if if all our lovely listeners and readers out there could just keep in mind what what these people's agenda is, I think that's especially out in the media, whether you are, um, I guess, like you've put it here, Terry, right, um, that often press releases are sent out to the media and these are then, um, I guess, rewritten as as fact. Yeah. Right. Look, no, no, nothing is written in our major media about the housing markets unless someone puts out a press release. Mm. Um, everything is press release driven. And of course, press release by definition is somebody's propaganda. Their, yes. their motivation isn't to help us or inform us. Their motivation mm. is to achieve publicity for themselves and their yes. business. Yes. And they know, they know that the, the surefire method of it guaranteeing that free publicity is to come out with something that's a sensational negative. And so yes. that's what most of them do. Yes, exactly. So keep this in mind, please, everyone. Um, you know, don't just assume it's fact or that it's credible because it's been published um, by a major media outlet. A lot of the people writing these stories are not property experts, I assure you. Um, they ring me as the property expert. And, you know, obviously you try, you want to present fact, but the people writing these stories are not property experts, right? Um, yeah. And those headlines are intended to pure clickbait. Yeah. yeah. And, and yeah. I, I, you know, every day oh. here at Hotspotting, Kate, we're delving into media because we're looking for information that can inform our reports. Mm. So we're seeing everything that's written and it startles me the degree to which the headline does not actually accurately oh. reflect what's in the article. Absolutely. The yes. headlines have become more and more dishonest because their mm. objective is to get you to click on it. And that's, yes. that's what it's all about. Yes, yes, exactly. So everyone, please keep that in mind. Um, so moving on, um, I genuinely believe that the window of opportunity to get into the market at a good price is now. Um, do keep in mind that, you know, having said all of that, that as I've said earlier on, that we are, you know, a lot of the markets that we are buying in, you just saw that chart of what is happening elsewhere other than Sydney and Melbourne. A lot of those rem markets remain super active and they are definitely not slowing down. Like I said, Adelaide, right? It is still crazy over there. Crazy town, Adelaide. Um, we're still one of many, many offers. Um, there's a lot of cash buyers. We're missing out to cash buyers. Often an owner-occupier making unconditional offers, right? Obviously, we don't take those sorts of risks for our clients, but that's what you're up against over there. Um and, and I think partly that can be driven by it's a very affordable market. It's a very stable market. I'll talk a bit more about Adelaide later. Um, but it, it's garnering a lot of attention at the moment also because it's an affordable market, you know, with people's borrowing capacity um, that little bit less. Yeah, it's, 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 it lures and the yields are awesome. So it does lure investors in. But if we look at what some of those growth drivers are for now onwards, really. Um, the shortage of rental properties. I could probably do an entire webinar just on that subject. <laughs> I won't. Um, but we are, we have been, we are in a rental shortage crisis. It's been building for a number of years. I've been going on about this for months and months and months and months. Um, there's been a lot of uh, policies and banking and lending policies that have deterred investors. Obviously, we had the pandemic. Last year, we had 
I think in Queensland alone, over 65% of properties sold were sold by investors to owner occupiers. It's a lot of property coming out the market. We also had that Queensland land tax uh, debacle, which thankfully is off the table now. But um, the rental shortage is going to get worse before it gets better, in my opinion. Um, yields are going to grow. We're, yeah. we're still seeing a shortage of listings in terms of not just rentals, but also of housing, you know, uh, sales for sales. Listings are still way, way down what they were um, pre-pandemic. Developers, they, they are not basically they're not building enough houses, right? Um, home building is down. Um, so obviously you'll read in the press that some builders are going out of business. There's a supply shortage. There's a labor shortage. They're not building enough housing. We are going to hit a supply shortage from new properties as well. <clears throat> Our borders were back. Sorry, go on, Terry. Sorry. And developers deferring projects simply because the numbers mm. don't add up. But the costs have mm. increased so much that it's just not economic for developers yeah. to build some of those mm. high rise. So they're just mm. deferring projects. Yeah. And that means the supply that um, would normally be in the market isn't going to be there. Mm. So the, the issue of shortage is going to continue. Yes, absolutely. Um, and then when we come back to um, demand, our borders are open. Governments have and are lifting the, the caps on the number of migration um, of migrants that are coming into the country. We need them. We always have. Um, you know, we are as ev everyone I talk to at the moment, whatever industry that they work in, they're struggling to find good staff. Everyone. I don't know where everyone's gone, to be honest, but um, <laughs> um, it's it's really trickling through now um, that we need we need workers. We need that's, you know, Australia relies on migrants for its population growth. Um, and I, I keep saying it. I don't know where they're all going to live because we're already in a housing shortage crisis. The politicians ne never think through the consequences of no. their decisions, do they? They don't seem to think beyond the press conference. No. We're going to solve the problem with um, filling job vacancies by bringing in an extra, say, 50,000 migrants over and above the normal numbers. Yes. But no one's thought to ask where are they going to live? Where are they going to live? And, and, let's, and let's, let's discourage every investor out there from buying a rental property. So, yeah. And, oh, and we're not going to build enough supply to house all these people either. So, mm. Well, they're exactly. going to build, Kate, they're going to build a, a million new homes. Unfortunately, <laughs> they're not going to start doing it until 2024. Uh, so it doesn't really help anybody in 2023. Uh, no. Who, who needs... Somewhere don't, to read right now. And don't get me started on that elbow round table of his. You know, I don't think a single expert from the property industry was invited to actually enter into those discussions and debates with them to advise on what's actually going on out there. And the Queensland There's... State Government recently had a talk fest for the same reason, which <laughs> purported to show that they cared about the rental shortage. Mm. But they didn't invite any representatives of the people who are the solution property <laughs> investors. So people I was not invited, nor no. any any other organisation that represents investors. They are the solution. 92% yeah. um, of the properties rented in Australia are provided by the private investors, not by government. Indeed. But they weren't invited to the table. So I know. That wasn't I know. even talked about. I know. So, but in the meantime, I'll get off my soapbox, um, that all of that equals shortage of rentals, shortage of housing as well. What we're talking about here, there is huge infrastructure spend underway in all sorts of different areas on all sorts of different really good projects, um, some of which I'll go through shortly. Um, in the meantime, we still have stimuluses for you know our first home buyer boosts, um, which again keeps our first home buyers in the market, um, but not investors um, who we really, really need. And, and like you've said here, Terry, real estate does thrive in times of disruption, as we saw during 2020. Right. Absolutely. So. And also post GFC was another time when mm. um, there was a lot of disruption. The economist forecast at that time that prices were going to drop 40 or 50 percent. And of course, in the following two years, prices rose because yes. real estate thrives. Yes. Uh, people trust it. Um, they know it's safe. And that's where they turn in times of disruption. Yes, exactly. Um, and the pandemic, I think, I mean, it was such a, uh, obviously unsettling at the time, but interesting to sort of watch what was happening, that that, it, that is exactly what happened, you know, and because our economy didn't collapse 
um, that people couldn't spend their money on the things that they usually spend their money on, it's exactly where they chose to put money. A lot of people, you know, bought their homes, um, they bought property. We were still busy, you know, from, from an investment point, uh, perspective. It's not enough, but um, but yes. So looking at some actual areas. Now, again, I could sit here for the rest of the afternoon and talk about fantastic areas um, uh, that are ripe opportunities. Um, but all the areas really that we were buying in for our clients in the last 10 years remain really good areas that we buy in in the future. They all have very steady growth drivers. Um, and I guess I, the other thing I thought I would I'd just quickly do is that um, in um, early 2020, Terry, when we did uh, another webinar together, I know we've done some since then, but we did one early 2020 um, or mid 2020 as the pandemic was sort of underway. Um, and we looked at Bendigo and what was happening there at the time. So April 2020, there you go. That's when we did this. Um, there's a growth chart there. I've just randomly picked a suburb in southern Bendigo there. We had a vacancy rate in 2020 of 0.9%. And a median value of, um, let me just sorry, because I've got you and me blended in there. Median value there of 360,000. Um, and as of literally yesterday, um, we have a vacancy rate there of 0.5%. So it's not hugely different, um, but you can see how very steady um, those vacancy rates are. And I'd also like to point out um, that, you know, that, that little spike there at two, in 2014. Those vacancy rates were still only three and a half percent, right? So while now we're all getting used to these point something vacancy rates, um, you know, we would generally think of three percent or under as being a relatively healthy vacancy rate. So they were still only, it looks like an enormous number of vacancies. It was still only three and a half percent. And our median values in the meantime have increased to 535,000. So um, very much unaffected by what happened um, pandemic wise. And overall, as you'll notice, a wonderfully steady, lovely growth chart. I like those kind of charts. Um, sorry, let me just wander on. Where are we? Here we go. Sunny coast, um, very sort of similar. The vacancy rates were a little bit higher than we just saw in, vac in, in, in Bendigo at 2.8%. They are now 1%. Again, typically they are, they have been very low for the past 12 years. They do spike up and down a little bit in that in that area because it has been prone to overdevelopment at times. Um, a lot of units, obviously, it's the Sunshine Coast, so you're going to get all sorts of stuff happening there. Um, and our median values have gone from five 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 to seven nine five. Keep in mind that is, of course, a median, um, but again, a lovely steady growth chart. And with the, that um, spike there that we've seen since 2020. Um, and ongoing great area. Um, and then in the city of Marion in uh, southern Adelaide, we had a very, very low vacancy rate there, probably around 0.4. It is now 0.2. I think Adelaide still has one of the lowest vacancy rates, if not the lowest vacancy rates overall in the whole country, Terry, right? If I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Adelaide is ridiculous. It is know, ridiculous. The whole country is a crisis, but I don't know yeah. how you describe <laughs> Adelaide. There's, there are some posters. I, I put a, at a presentation I was doing the other day. I put a mm. chart on, on one of my slides showed the city of Onkaparinga. Yeah. 13 postcodes and the highest vacancy figure was 0.6%. Most of them were 0, mm. 0 0.1, 0 0.2%. Yeah. Yeah, um, but but it's like that right across Adelaide. It is. It's it's, it's quite. Dark. It's crazy. Mm, mm. Um, um, and again, you can see that growth chart there of um, you know, again, very steady in that area, um, and and that spike since since twenty twenty, which we've seen in all all our um, uh, all our good growth areas that we're buying in. So moving forward, um, I'm looking at. And I have spoken about this before. I think it continues to be super appealing from an investor perspective. Um, it is the area, Western Sydney around Badgerys Creek. So we are looking at those cities there around Blacktown, around Liverpool, even down to Campbelltown. Um, obviously the big, the big draw card down there, over there, I should say, is, is the airport. 
the uh, that whole region destined to become economic powerhouse. Um, they are spending billions out there. Um, the that region surrounding the airport called the Aerotropolis. It's being um, developed into this employment hub that includes the science park. I've, I've listed some of the things at the bottom of that slide um, just to show you how many billions are being spent um, on road infrastructure. There's rail lines. There's the science park. The, there's the Penrith Health Precinct. There is so much happening out there. Uh, the airport being like the catalyst. But, um, you know, in an airport, obviously, is a big in injection in terms of infrastructure, but also spending into the into the economy. Um, they're looking to um, take twice the number of passengers that are currently serviced by mascot. Um, and that population growth is set to swell exceptionally much, much, much more so than the than the typical Sydney average, which has historically trended a little bit below national average probably around 1.5 1.6 um but um but that particular as a as an average but this particular area that population growth around those western sydney fringes have typically and consistently been above the national average um over the last decade which of course gives us supply um when uh, sorry demand when it comes to when it comes to property right rentals um and and and, and owner occupiers and, and like I say, there's some of those um, uh, projects there just to so you can add up all the billions that are being spent. And it's going gangbusters. I'm out there occasionally having a look at how it's going on because <laughs> I like to watch. How often do you get to watch an airport being built? Right. So. That's right. And it's, it's all the associated infrastructure. Yeah. As well as these transport yeah. links to the airport. Well, there's a whole lot more happening out there. So. Well, that's one of the growth economies of the nation, Western yes. Sydney. And it's interesting to look at um, the long-term capital growth figures for, like, the suburbs of the city of Blacktown, for example. Okay. Yes. A lot of people have this mentality, well, it's a long <laughs> way from the CBD and it's way out west, and so it doesn't have <laughs> the same growth as inner city areas. Well, that's just yeah. not true. It's, no, I mean, it's every, every suburb in Blacktown city has got a long-term growth rate of 9 or 10% a year mm. over 10 years, which is exceptional. That's right. Exactly. Um, because the demand is there, right? Um, it's not just all about the city. There are, when you look at, um, you know, the jobs that people do, when you look at demographics um, of, you know, inner city is often much more, it's a much more transient population, often depends on the suburb, of course. And this is why during the pandemic, all our, you know, especially in Melbourne and Sydney and Brisbane as well, our inner cities were decimated because, you know, all, the, all that transient population, the backpackers, the tourists, the more temporary workers, they were gone. Um, everything lay vacant. You know, those markets um, really struggled for two years. It's all coming back now, of course, but for two years, they, they, you know, those markets struggled. So, um, and it's it's a really good sign when you see those consistent growth drivers throughout these times of turmoil remaining consistent, not being affected by a thing like the, even the global pandemic, right? That to me is a sign of a really stable, diverse area that is not going to get affected by even that sort of thing happening. And out in Western Sydney, that's exactly why. Um, you, you, you're not, you're not um, you know, it's kind of normal people, as I say, normal families and normal people, you know, kids going to school and and jobs and that's exactly what these infrastructure projects lead to better lifestyle more job opportunities and that's basically what people are looking for right in life so um yeah so here are these are very typical growth charts for sydney um and there you can see them we're not quite at the end of 2022 yet obviously there's still sales going on and settling but you can see no uh, forecasted plummeting price drops, as um, we like to read about, and well, we don't like to read about, but as we are reading about in the media. And then moving on to um, the city of Marion in Adelaide. Um, again, oh gosh, you can't go past Adelaide. It's such a, um, it's it's never mentioned. You can see, I'll bring you back to slide. What was it, Terry? Four, five. <laughs> When you can see, you know, the, the year to October, um, what's going on, Adelaide, Adelaide, right? It was still delivering 13, 14 um, percent um, in terms of growth. It, 
most Adelaide suburbs really do just keep producing very steady growth, consistent demand and awesome yields, right? Especially in the north. The north. I could have featured the north side, actually. I sat to deliberating, should I do the north or the south? Um, so um, in that area, we have that billion dollar private investment in that Tonsley Innovation District. Um, that whole area is amazing what they've done um, since the car manufacturing factory closed. There's new teaching hospital, university campuses. Again, those things are big drivers in the economy. They're in big employers. They bring people in and people often stay as well. Um, and, and Flinders University has announced the plan to build um, a $1.5 billion village at the Bedford Park campus. It's very nice around there. Um, you've got major transport projects. You've got the um, Torrance to Darling transport upgrade. That's it's a huge infrastructure project making the you know tra transport through Adelaide um, even quicker, um, more pleasant. You're not stopping at fifteen thousand traffic lights. <laughs> um, you've got freight hubs, seaports, further business opportunities. Again, billions and billions being spent on quality infrastructure and things that, like I say, that bring in employment, things that are, are meaningful infrastructure projects that are that improve people's job prospects um, in good areas with access to great facilities, which lead to a good lifestyle. Um, and we've, we've just published our new edition of the National Top 10 yes. uh, Infrastructure Hotspots, because we believe infrastructure generates mm. real growth like nothing else. And the city of Marion is featured in that report because of all the things you've just highlighted. Yes, yes. And um, honourable mentions, otherwise, because otherwise we'll sit here for another three hours. Um, I, I, again, it's hard. It's really hard almost <laughs> to narrow it down. So I've tried to encompass all my favourite areas into one slide. <laughs> um, Olympic precinct um, in Brisbane. So <clears throat> as we all know, 2032, uh, Olympics are coming to Brisbane. Do have a look around opportunities around that area. Again, a lot of infrastructure being built. A lot. I mean, Brisbane, in fairness, was the only contender really, but and a lot of that infrastructure uh, is already in place. But there is a lot of uh, like the Gabba's being. You know, there's a billion dollars I think being spent on upgrading that. And um, there's the metro. There's heaps of things going on around that precinct to revitalise the area. Mm. Craig, when um, the announcement came that Brisbane and Queensland, it's not just Brisbane, but um, yeah. was going to host the 2032 Olympics, there was quite a lot of research published on the impact that an Olympics can have on property values. Yes. And the two things that stood out for me, because there were different research sources and they tended to agree, the biggest impact is in the years leading up to the event, not after the event. And it's pretty much mm. the, um, the, the construction um, boom that's precipitated by preparing for the Olympics. Yeah. Um, mm. And the other thing that stood out was that the suburbs close to the main venues for the Olympics are the ones that have the highest capital growth typically. And that this is comes from studying other cities that have hosted Olympics. So mm. hence why you've uh, highlighted the Olympic precinct, that tends to be the suburbs around the Gabba. So you've yes. got suburbs like uh, Kangaroo Point, Wollongabba itself, East Brisbane, mm. um, Anna Lee, I think, is a very good suburb um, just south of there. Those suburbs clustered around there, which are all good suburbs anyway. Uh, they're going to get uh, increased buying interest because mm. of the Olympic focus. Yes, indeed. Um, and there are other, um, you know, other towns out of Brisbane, like Ipswich, Moreton Bay, which I've also put down here, um, Logan, Shire in the south, that will also benefit. You know, there are some events happening in those areas too. Um, I've got the Sunshine Coast as number two. Um, I think long term, this area, again, has awesome potential. I, You know, it's come such a long way in, in the last 10 years, just in terms of my interest in it, because it's diversified its industries. It's not just a tourism town like the Gold Coast can be. Um, there's so much else going on there that it, it will continue to thrive, even if even if the tourists stop coming. Obviously, tourism is still a major industry for the area, but there is so much um, there's so much else going on that people are the people in terms of employment um, industries. Um, it's I think you know in the whole of Southeast Queensland was the single biggest receiver of interstate migrants 
during and post pandemic. There was those figures, I think, that came out recently from the ABS where New South Wales lost 100,000 people. And it's since the last census and uh, Southeast Queensland gained exactly 102. <laughs> so it's almost person for person. We've all headed up your way. And I don't see that um, ending anytime soon. I personally know several people you know, friends who have moved um, away from Sydney or Melbourne and headed up to southeast Queensland. Kate, there's this thing that's um, being produced called the Regional Movers Index. Um, yeah. Which the Regional Australia Institute has, has developed. But because of this trend, we call it the Exodus to Affordable Lifestyle. Yes. It's been away for a long time. It wasn't caused by the pandemic, as the media would have us believe. It's been happening for much longer. Mm. And it continues. The latest figures show mm. that... Um, that the, the drift to people moving to the regions is as strong as ever. And that um, the, the most popular places that people have, those are sort of list of the top six, I think the Sunshine Coast uh, and the Gold Coast were numbers one and two in Australia. Mm, yes. So it, it's yes. going to continue to, I mean, it, it's mm. just a, a big city that has everything, wonderful beaches. Oh. And it's got a wonderful <laughs> hinterland where I'm currently sitting right Indeed. now. Indeed. <laughs> Didn't like to say. Absolutely. And, and I would choose the Sunshine Coast every day of the week over the Gold Coast, just because from an investment perspective, I know the Gold Coast is the, it's the one that gets spruiked all the time. It's very appealing. It looks appealing, but it does to me. It doesn't have anywhere near the same um, basic growth fundamentals that the Sunshine Coast does, anywhere near the same amount. So I'd be very cautious moving forward um always about anything gold coast related and certainly that tourist strip the hinterland possibly but i'd still i'd still i would always prefer to put um investment dollars into the sunshine coast um regional victorian cities geelong ballarat bendigo oh what's oh my god you know again it's the whole of the webinar um were consistent are always consistent um again benefited from the exodus to affordable lifestyles um uh, during and post pandemic, um, but they continue to perform well. Awesome intrinsic growth drivers. Um, but also, outer Melbourne suburbs, so the southeast around the Cranbournes, um, Frankston, people might recall in horror, awesome investment area. Um, and then um, the north side of Melbourne as well. Um, uh, Toowoomba, my gosh, let's talk about the billions being spent in Toowoomba on infrastructure projects. Um, Again, very diverse industry, Australia's second largest inland city. Indeed, and um, the two massive things working together, the new airport and the soon to be their inland rail link, biggest infrastructure project in the country right now. Yes. Is the Queensland hub for it. And it had, and so it's yeah. going to create this incredible mm. transport hub, the airport side by side with the, the rail hub. Mm. Um, we now have massive businesses establishing operations in Toowoomba mm. um, for that reason, including Boeing, which has never manufactured outside of the North America before. It's setting up in Toowoomba mm. because of those transport links that weren't there before. Yes, amazing, right. Amazing yes, stuff. that's right. And that's and that comes back to what I mean by you know meaningful infrastructure projects, things that will create um, employment most of all, right? Um, and then Moreton Bay, perennial favourite, um, and Northern Adelaide, again, um, very popular at the moment um, because of its the purchase price that you can get into, a minimum 5% yield that you can expect there, um, which is pretty much unheard of in the country at the moment, in great growth areas, I mean, of course. Um, very affordable. Again, like I say, great growth drivers um, um, and uh, good prospects. So... There's a lot to choose from there, people. <laughs> um, de depending on your purchase price, obviously your requirements for cash flow needs. You know, um, so if you look at some of those areas that we're looking at in that Western Sydney area, you know, you're going to need at least eight fifty, at least, and that would be a bit of an older property. You might get five five thirty a week rent ish. It's an older property. The cash flow. Most people are on P and I loans now, so. Um, you know, you really need to watch your cash flow there versus some of these other areas where the buy-in price is a lot less and the yields are potentially better. Um, well, they are, they are better. Um, and you have equally great growth drivers moving forward, right? So don't think that you can't afford to invest at the moment because you can.
is what I would say here as well. Um, and that is pretty much, um, I think that was the last slide apart from our call to action. Um, please do go out and buy the book, The Female Investor. <gasps> Great Christmas present, shameless plug. Um, I always like to offer a little discount on our full service buyers agency uh, for anyone who watches these webinars and um, lets us know that. Um, I have my very own YouTube channel, which of course is fabulous and full of information and news, um, little hints and tips, property related. Uh, send me an email, give us a call. Um, do leave me a message. Um, I get a lot of spam calls. So please do let leave me a message and I will call you back if you need or would like a chat. Right. There's bound to be some questions out there. All right. And I do encourage people <laughs> to. Well, well done, Kate. You have actually finished on time. Hey! Allowing us at least 15 minutes to, Gold star. Do, to <laughs> deal with uh, people's questions. I know. I and I have, to, I have to rein it in. Gold star for Kate. Go on. Type your questions into either the Q&A panel or the chat box. <laughs> and um, Aaron, um, who's been watching the, the various places we've talked about, said there's no mention of Perth. Um, ah, yeah. I know. I agonised. I did, Aaron. I agonised. I nearly featured northern Perth. Um, so again, a lot of good areas over there. Sorry, read me the question before I launch in. Well, he's just, he's just noting we haven't <laughs> mentioned Perth in our discussion. It. Um, mm. it, it, it does warrant some mention, I do, mm -hmm. I do, do you think? Yes. Um, I should have put it in the honourable mentions, Aaron. Apologies. Um, I think because I was really, I'm going to iron whether to give it its whole own slide. Um, Perth has been, as we all know, what Mark McGowan did, he cut the entire state off from the rest of us. Um, they, they've been in their own little bubble, really, property bubble. Um, vacancy rates there are as low as they are around the rest of the country. There has not been any kind of slowdown when it comes to uh, median house pricing, the demand is still there. We were in a little bit of a watch and wait mode because of uh, what you could call the brain drain after what those policies, um, COVID policies that the WA government implemented in terms of just cutting them off, not letting anyone in or out. Um, a lot of people objected to that <laughs> um, and didn't want to be cut off from friends and family our um, here over in the east, eastern states. Um, so we we've kind of, like I say, been in a bit of a watch and wait um, and see mode. Even I've been guilty of that um, because we needed to sort of see what was going to happen there um, in terms of demand. But it has not abated. It continues to be strong. I think the migration levels to Perth are subdued. Um, people are still a little bit, um, they were, uh, you know, once bitten, twice shy, but by that state being closed off from the rest of the country. So, but but it is a strong market. The prices are very affordable, also really good yields. Um, it is a more volatile market often. Um, I, unfortunately, it is, you know, it, it is resource related often, but can also be buyer sentiment or just general sentiment related, even if that's not actually fact, if you see what I mean. So, um, but I, I definitely think it's worth a look. Um, the north side, Jundalup, um, train line extensions, big housing estates going in, they're developing a lot in terms of new schools, infrastructure, whole um, new villages and suburbs going in. So, and, and the improved train line into um, into Perth CBD, much improved. Everyone who lives closer is complaining because the train's full by the time they get on it. Um, uh, yes. Anything okay. else? Mm. Moving on to yep. uh, some other question. Dashani um, is looking to buy a home in New South and Sydney area. I was wondering, where? where's, the, where's the best for long-term capital growth? Penrith, Gregory Hills or Campbelltown? Do you have an opinion? I, I might have an opinion, but I don't have a crystal ball. Um, uh, I'm going to go Penrith, just because it's closer to the action of where the airport, what's happening around the airport. 
I, you know, I perhaps would tend to agree. I think Penrith is um, is, is a is a good one to consider. It's um, it's it's a real community in its own yeah. right. Um, it's got affordability more so than most parts, but it's got that proximity to all the big action that's happening yeah. out there. And um, there's also going to be, I think, they're talking about building a tunnel that to take you up through the Blue Mountains. Blue Mountains. So, yeah, it's off again, on again, off again, on again. So um, they're arguing. Yeah. Okay, forget about that. Um, <laughs> I think it's on again. I'm not just, sure. Just for, just for everything that <laughs> um, that Penrith offers um, and mm. its proximity to the action, I, I think it's a good place to consider. Yes. Um, Adele's asking, is Ocean Grove part of the Geelong Grove story? I think, I think it is part of Geelong, isn't it? I'd have to look it up. I know I'm normally encyclopedic about suburbs. I'm really sorry. I'd have to look that where that is. I'm really sorry. Um, yeah, but, but it definitely is, it's part it's part of that market. It's, yes. it's one of the more upmarket parts, but does certainly um no, Geelong's an amazing story, I think. Oh, and it's just it rolling ever? on. It's had four or five years of growth. So oh. it's a, a point to make you mentioned regional Victoria, you mentioned Geelong, Bendigo, Ballarat. Um, and we talked about the Brisbane Olympics. Well, let's not forget that. Um, Games. Victoria is going to be hosting the Commonwealth Games in four years' time. And for the first time ever, it's not going to be held in one big city. It's going to be held yes. in regional cities um, of Victoria. And that's going to mm. be huge, a, an extra wave of demand for these um, Geelong, Ballarat, Bendigo and Gippsland is going to come from that event. And yes. To it. It's too many areas to talk about. We're going to be here all afternoon. Yeah. Absolutely. Geelong, someone's, asking about, someone's asking about Melton and, and the western suburbs of yeah. uh, Melbourne. Oh, that's always an interesting story because um, there. I apologise to anyone who lives there. Please don't email me. Um, it's there. When I say there's, there's not a lot there, I, I, mean, I don't kind of mean it like that. It's a lovely place. I've been there. It's, I've investigated. It's the same as Bacchus Marsh. Um, well, it's not the same, but... Um, there's it really started out as just one big to me one big housing estate one development after another to house the overspill from Melbourne um I think that is likely to change a little bit over the coming years um I don't see it as having major oomph moving forward simply because you don't have those same billions being spent in infrastructure as you do elsewhere okay. Um, you could it, do worse, though. Yeah, I, I do notice, you know, the, the, Melbourne's generally down a bit, you know, in terms of sales activity. I'm analysing at the moment, but Melbourne, mm. the suburbs of Melbourne is one area where the sales activity is holding up quite well, which is mm. encouraging. Mm. Um, just a point, Renata, you just mentioned that you, you, you're you late joining Can You Access a Recording. Everyone who registers for this event will receive a recording of it, so you can watch it again, or people who couldn't watch live can watch it at their leisure. Um, a point that Thomas made, he's, he says, I personally love the story of Adelaide, and he, he speaks about that, but he says, um, the, what about the lack of immigration to Adelaide and South Australia? My personal view is that that's, um, that's changed and is yes. changing. I think Adelaide, you know, things are always moving. Nothing stays the same um, with economies and with real estate. Adelaide's a city undergoing significant change for the better. It's um, grabbed some very important pieces of the national story for itself, particularly, I think it's the Silicon Valley of Australia. It's the high-tech innovation capital. Yeah. Lots of big businesses, including international businesses, are making their Australian headquarters in Adelaide for that reason. Yes. It's also got a big education economy. It's got a big defence economy. It's going to be attracting migration from other parts of Australia in the future more so than it has in the past, I believe. But also agreed, absolutely, as always. <laughs> But um, it, 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 it did get put on the map. I, again, personally, anecdotally, I know people who moved from the eastern states to Adelaide, shock horror. That had never, that's, had never happened before. So it's, again, that's, and it's, I think partly COVID will have facilitated that with the whole work from home. You don't need to, and Adelaide didn't cut itself off from the rest of the country or South Australia didn't do that. It's, it's an only hour and a half, hour, hour and a half away so it, it was it's definitely um, put itself on the map um, and it's continues to be of interest to people um, who want, uh, you know, just more bang for their buck in terms of property with great, great job prospects in all those industries that Terry's talking about. So and, and, it, and it does remain very popular with overseas migrants 
um, also because of the way their visa system works. So, yeah. Okay. Um, now, Lena is asking about what we think about um, Hobart and uh, Tasmania. We haven't really touched on that. No. No, you can take that one, Terry. I'm not massively active there. Yeah. Look, um, Hobart's been one of the amazing real estate stories of the last five years. It's, um, you know, we've had a national boom in the last couple of years, but Hobart's been booming for longer. Um, and that's because its state economy has gone from last to first. Um, there's a big correlation, we think, between what's happening in a local economy and its real estate performance. Tasmania used to rank last in the State of the States report published by Comsec. It's risen mm -hmm. to first and it's been there for the last 18 months. Coinciding with that has been the rise of Hobart real estate. Um, it um, used to be the cheapest city in Australia. Now it's more expensive by far than Perth or Adelaide or Darwin. It's close to being on a par with Brisbane. So it's no longer a cheap city. I think it's past its peak for now because it's had five years of fantastic growth. But um, Tasmanian Hobart is going to be a great place to own real estate going forward, I think. Um, let's see. Aaron is asking about Bundy. Do you mean Bundaberg? I assume you do in um, Queensland. Queensland. Um, Great infrastructure investment, uh, diversity, population, low vacancies, yes. Um, Kate, is that on your radar screen, Bundaberg? It's it, it's more, how do I put this? It's more regional than we would generally buy in for our clients, but that's that doesn't mean it's not a great area to invest in. What I would tell people is to get your top 10, is to get a couple of your top 10 reports, get the infrastructure, Terry's infrastructure report, get the top 10 location report, top 10 national location report. That will tell you everything you need to know, in my yeah. opinion. I think, I think Bundaberg is <laughs> worth considering. Yeah. And it's, mm. it's, a much, it's a much bigger city than people realise. It's got a very strong economy, very prosperous place. There's a billion-dollar hospital and planning there by the state government. It's the expansion of its airport and its export port is happening Um and still very affordable despite the growth it's had in, in the last couple of years. So worthy of consideration for those who are thinking regional. I think Queensland's um, a place generally that offers a number of options that are affordable with high yeah. yields um, mm. with growth prospects. Mm. Um, uh, and us, we've got uh, anonymous attendee saying, Kate, could you expand on rental growth in Victoria? I have an investment probably in Geelong. The rent growth has been low compared to Queensland. Um, mm, do you have any thoughts about that? Uh, surprised. Um, I, uh, I obviously don't know this, the circumstances, so I'm not sure if you mean specifically with your property or overall, um, but overall the vacancy rates remain really, really low um, and they will continue to do so as with all the areas that we're talking about today. So I'd investigate um, perhaps specifically if that is with your property, if there's something you can do there to up up your rent or if perhaps your uh, if you have a property manager if they're not um, perhaps not on the ball but I would I, I have I don't have a single property myself um, that hasn't gone up significantly in rent this year. And that's right. I'd be surprised if yeah. it doesn't, doesn't have good rent. Yeah. I mean, it's a fact around the country that um, it's now common to see rents going up, you know, 20% in a year. Yeah. There's, Look, there's, no, there's no solution in sight. That's the thing. No. So, if, if, it, if, if, if in your particular suburb, if it has been a little bit lackluster, I'd just give it time. It will happen. The other thing, of course, is that Geelong has had a couple of periods of booming growth before the pandemic. Um, like it had a year and a half of exceptionally good capital growth, which obviously keeps yields low. So if you are looking at just yield growth, then that could be why rather than actual, um, you know, the actual rents of your property going up as well, which I know sounds a bit, they should be the same, but it, it, it does make a difference. Um, and, uh, you know, typically yield growth will come after capital growth. It was a bit strange during the pandemic where we did have both happening at the same time. Yield uh, capital growth is sort of eased off in some locations, and now we're just seeing rents go through the roof. So I would also say just be patient, but investigate as to why your rent isn't isn't going up the way it should be. Okay, we've got a 
Um, I was to ask you about our thoughts on Underwood in the Logan City area, mm. southern suburbs of Brisbane. Um, yeah, look, I, I, I tend not to go too suburb specific. I do still, I love the Logan Shire. I uh, can continue to do so. Good, good, affordable pricing, great infrastructure, awesome yields, um, halfway, sort of halfway between Brisbane um, or sort of well placed between Brisbane, Ipswich, Gold Coast. So people have a choice of where they can work. Really good employment opportunities. I, I really like that whole that whole area. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Sorry, I know we're pushed for time, probably nearly. Yeah, look, look, I agree. I agree with you that it, mm. some people tend to fixate on individual suburbs. We don't think like that. We think it's more no. about areas, precincts, clusters. Mm. Um, Logan City, definitely, yes. Um, yeah. Tremendous growth potential. Still one of the most affordable parts of Brisbane. Great location. Look, um, time is up, Kate. Um, you, I know you're in demand. You've got to, you've got to rush off to another um, <laughs> pressing appointment. Okay. Um, but oh, um, I'd like to thank you for a great presentation, oh, wonderful information. Such a pleasure. Um, I'd like to remind people again about the book. Um, uh, the award-winning book, if you don't the mind. The award-winning book, <laughs> uh, Female Investor. Um, it's, it's worth getting a coffee. It's a great thank read. You. It's a very useful compendium thank for property you. investors. And be also remember the, the discount offer that's currently on yes. your screens for those who want to email me. Themselves of um, your services provided by Advisable. Thank you so much. It's been great. Love uh, doing it. Thanks a lot, Kate. It's always great Pleasure. talking to you about real estate. Um, congratulations on the book. Um, we'll do it again soon, but it'll probably be next year when we next we have one of these chats. Yes, we can catch up on all the other stuff that all those forecasters got wrong. Exactly right. Um, <laughs> Thank certainly... you, everyone. Thank you, Terry. And we are expecting 2023 to be a year of growth. Don't believe the media. <laughs> Good, good Curry turn from Hot Spotting and Kate Hill from Advisable signing off. Bye for now. Bye, everyone.